Tonight, a deadly blast at the border. The investigation into why a car suddenly exploded near the Rainbow Bridge. The shocking moment the vehicle went airborne. It was just a fireball and smoke everywhere. The chaos and the closures. There is no sign of terrorist activity. A lot of relief. A former RCMP official found guilty of leaking secrets. Also, the agony for families of Hamas hostages waiting for dozens to be released. It's the unknown that kills slowly. Plus, reaction to reports of a thwarted assassination plot targeting a dual citizen of Canada and the U.S. And missions accepted. I'm incredibly proud and grateful and just excited. Launching the dreams of two Canadian astronauts. CTV National News with Omar Sachadina. Good evening, everyone. New details in that fiery explosion at the Rainbow Bridge, which connects Canada and the U.S. at Niagara Falls. The two people dead are now believed to be husband and wife. I've never seen anything like this. The car just exploded. A terrifying scene as flames roared near a checkpoint building after a vehicle vaulted into the air after hitting a median and exploded. It all happened on one of the busiest travel days in the U.S. on the eve of American Thanksgiving. Investigators still piecing together what exactly happened. CTV's Adrian Gobriel is near the scene in Niagara Falls, Ontario tonight. Adrian. Omar, tense hours here at the Rainbow Bridge as fears of a cross-border terror attack led to the complete closure of four critical border crossings. A car careening through the air catches the eye of a security camera and the concerns of two nations. He went up into the air and we just seen the fireball and that's all we could see. It was just covered in smoke everywhere. I've never seen anything like this. The chaotic scene resulting in this exploded. inferno, sparking an FBI investigation. The question of the day, was this terror related? New York's governor doing her best to ease any anxiety this evening. More information could arise, but based on the preliminary investigation, no sign of terrorist involvement in the horrific explosion that occurred here in western New York. U.S. law enforcement believe the driver of the vehicle was from western New York State. Two people have been confirmed dead with a Border Patrol agent in hospital tonight. I seen something airborne. I first thought it was an airplane. It looked like slow motion. And I said, my God, it's a car. He was flying over 100 miles an hour. The deadly incident led to the closure of all four border crossings in the area for much of the day. Three have since reopened, signaling that this may have been an isolated incident. There was also heightened security at Buffalo Airport. On the Canadian side, snow plows, regional and provincial police blocked off access to the Rainbow Bridge. This all taking place during one of the busiest travel days of the year south of the border, as U.S. Thanksgiving weekend gets underway. I'm actually from uh, from the U.S., so we, we came over here um, hoping to uh, to see the falls uh, just for the day. We walked over. Our car's actually in New York right now, so um, yeah, perfect timing. Officials will have no choice but to take their time with this active investigation, which is very much in its early stages. This vehicle basically incinerated. Nothing is left but the engine. The pieces are scattered over 13, 14 booths. So it is a large scene, and it's going to take a lot of time for our federal law enforcement partners to be able to piece together the real story. The Rainbow Bridge right behind me normally sees 6,000 commercial vehicles each day. Tonight, it remains locked down and closed. Omar. Terrifying moments. All right, Adrian, thank you for this tonight. The security scare put both countries on high alert. CTV's Kevin Gallagher on the swift response. With tensions high, the Prime Minister briefed Canadians on the developing deadly explosion at the border. We are taking this extraordinarily seriously, and uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I will have to excuse myself now uh, to go get further, uh, further uh, updates. <laughs> Justin Trudeau soon left question period, seeking more answers from national security officials. U.S. President Joe Biden also received updates in Nantucket, where he's celebrating Thanksgiving with his family. 
And in Toronto, police stepped up patrols out of precaution, with the border only 90 minutes away. All of the appropriate law enforcement agencies were very much uh, stood up and activated uh, the moment this incident unfolded with their American counterparts. As terrorism was ruled out late this afternoon, I've been through this once or twice before. Former CSIS director Ward Elcock felt a sense of relief. When he first saw the explosion, he immediately thought of Ahmed Rassam, an Algerian national caught trying to cross into the U.S. from Canada in 1999, aiming to detonate a trunk full of explosives at the Los Angeles airport. Elcock says remaining questions will soon be answered. That would presumably be the ATF that will be looking at that and the FBI and their forensic capabilities. Between the two of them, they'll be able to determine what happened. And the case of Ahmed Rassam was considered a Canadian intelligence failure at the time and sparked tension with American partners. Today, officials on both sides of the border are working to understand how this happened. Omar? All right, Kevin, thank you. There is a verdict tonight in an unprecedented trial involving an ex-RCMP intelligence official who was found guilty of leaking classified information. It was the first time that charges under Canada's 1985 Security of Information Act have been tried in court. CTV's Judy Trin on the fate of a man who built his career going after criminals and today was declared one himself. After deliberating for two days, a jury convicted Cameron Ortis of leaking top secret information. The former director general of the RCMP's National Intelligence Coordination Center was the first person to be tried under Canada's Security of Information Act. Shocked and uh, extremely disappointed. Why? Because uh, I think an innocent man has just been found guilty of six serious offenses. A lot of relief. Um, we are pleased with the outcome. The Crown said that Ortis was passing classified information, some of it from Canada's Five Eyes allies, to individuals linked to international drug cartels and terror organizations. Both the prosecution and defense had to watch what they said in court. It's been very tricky. It's been very tricky. It's like you're walking on eggshells all the time. Yes. It's Why? Been, well, because of the national security issues because you're worried about what you can and cannot put into evidence. The defense argued Ortiz was acting to protect Canadians, guided by information provided by a foreign agency that could not be named. It was about authority and also it was about his intention, and the Crown didn't even try to say that he didn't do something in the public interest. Reporters were banned from court when Ortis took the stand in front of jurors. Redacted transcripts were provided days later. National security experts say the trial shows Canada's official secrets law works. It shows that we have legislation that can be enforced and that, and that we can actually prosecute people that leak or people that are, you know, let's say moles providing information to foreign services. With this conviction, Cameron Ortis faces up to 20 years in prison. He will be sentenced in January. But Omar, the defense plans to appeal the verdict. Judy Trin in Ottawa tonight. Judy, thanks. There are new details tonight about the deal to release hostages held by Hamas. Israel says that won't happen now until Friday. Karen Shem still doesn't know if her daughter Mia will be among the 50 to be freed. It's like a Russian wallet. We are waiting to see, to see who will come back home. The terms of the deal include a brief pause in fighting in Gaza, where there has been no end to the civilian suffering. Walk, look, look, look. They are massacring us, Jamal Elan says. Today, he learned 60 members of his family are now dead. CTV's Heather Wright on the much-anticipated break in the fighting. There is hope for families of those held hostage in Gaza, with the first of 50 people expected to be released at the end of the week. But there's also agony. We need to know if they're alive, if they're okay. Seven members of Gilad Korngold's family are believed to have been abducted on October 7th, including his son, daughter-in-law, and two grandchildren. I want everybody back, but I think... And it's a very tough decision, but I think the children and women need to get out. As part of the deal, Hamas will release 50 children and women held in Gaza. In exchange, Israel will release 150 Palestinian women and teenagers held in Israeli jails. There will be a four-day ceasefire with hostages released at least 10 at a time. Israel's ambassador to Canada says the hostages that remain in Gaza 
will be checked by the International Red Cross. Part of the deal is also to provide those who need with medication. Just imagine uh, elderly people, people without the medication for seven or eight weeks. But many key details are still being ironed out, such as how the exchange will take place, the route out of Gaza, and who will be included. Canadian Mayan Shavit doesn't believe her cousin will be released as part of this initial group. Her worries shared by so many families. Do they get any food and water? Uh, it's the unknown that kills slowly. <laughs> Airstrikes in Gaza continued ahead of the planned truce. Victims rushed from a neighborhood in Khan Yunus in the south after several homes were hit, killing at least 17 people. <laughs> We were sitting with our children in our home when suddenly a strike hit, this man says. While there is hope more aid will be able to flow into Gaza during the pause in fighting, some humanitarian agencies warn four days is not long enough to get help to those who need it most. More foreigners may also be able to leave. In Saskatoon, an emotional reunion for Abdullah al Gurbawi, whose family arrived home last night, having been stuck in Gaza for more than six weeks. Today, the World Health Organization said three-quarters of Gaza's residents are now internally displaced because of the war, with the death toll now more than 14,000, according to the Hamas-run health ministry. Omar. Heather Wright in Toronto tonight. A former senior American diplomat is in police custody in New York tonight and being investigated for hate crime after video of him surfaced making these comments and a warning. They are disturbing. Do you support terrorism? I'm not some bo bo you support I'm just working here. You're a terrible person. You killed children, not me. I didn't kill children. Okay, why see you here? You know why? If we killed 4,000 Palestinian kids, you know what? It wasn't enough. Stuart Seldowitz was deputy director in the State Department's yeah. Office of Israel and Palestinian Affairs you know under President Obama. He was caught on camera in a confrontation with a halal food cart yeah. vendor. He later said he regretted his words. Washington has expressed concerns with India, suggesting its government was behind a foiled assassination attempt on American soil. A Sikh separatist leader with ties to Canada was the target of the plot. He was a close ally of Canadian Hardeep Singh Nijar, who was killed in Surrey. This prompted a reaction from Canada, which is investigating India's role in the murder. On our side, what we expect from India is full cooperation in the investigation that our own law enforcement agencies are uh, undertaking. The fresh tensions come as India restored e-visa services for Canadians that had been suspended over the diplomatic spat. The final moments of an Ontario man were shown at the coroner's inquest into his violent jail cell death seven years ago. CTV's John Woodward spoke to his brother. Solomon, how are you? This video was recorded by prison guards at a correctional centre near Toronto in 2016. Can video this out, please? An attempt to show the worsening symptoms of this inmate, Soliman Fakiri, who was in the throes of a mental health crisis. Recording inmates was against policy, but an inquest heard this was a long-shot attempt to get prison management to understand his condition. He was a human being that deserved better, not to be given to his family in a body bag. Fakiri's brother Yusuf remembers him as a talented rugby player and engineering student. He says it's tragic he was treated like any other inmate. The prison psychiatrist didn't examine him. His family was barred from seeing him. And three days into his stay, records show the prison doctor concluded it would not be beneficial to send Mr. Fakiri to a hospital. That guard not the only one raising alarms. Notes entered into the inquest said a prison nurse was also saying Fakiri was extremely ill and needed help. A psychiatrist testified at the inquest that prison officials ignored repeated cues to send Fakiri to a hospital. Dr. Gary Chamowitz said knowing anything about clinical progress, this is not going to get better by itself. It will only get worse. By the 10th day, prison officials lost patients, notes say. Fakiri was forced into a segregation room and in the struggle with prison guards was killed. Let the evidence do the talking. Let the facts do the talking. See what happened to this man so we can prevent another death. So another tragedy that befell this family does not happen to another family. That's what this is about. He wants policies to change so an inmate who needs mental health care can get it before it's too late. John Woodward, CTV News, Toronto. Coming up, a digital power struggle in the world of AI. 
because of this battle, we're going to see artificial intelligence advance more quickly than it, it would have otherwise. Announced its CEO back on board. A stunning reversal for tech superstar Sam Altman. The creator of ChatGPT is back at his old job as CEO of OpenAI just days after he was fired. CTV's Joy Malbin on the Silicon Valley soap opera. It's enough to make your head spin. Sam Altman, the poster boy for artificial intelligence, who was abruptly fired by the board at his company, OpenAI, four days later rehired as CEO. Social media played up the drama as a Game of Thrones bloodbath. His colleagues posted, we're back. Altman himself saying, I love open AI and everything I've done over the past few days has been in service of keeping this team and its mission together. Insiders say the board pushed Altman out for wanting to pump the gas too quickly on the technology. Hundreds of employees threatened to quit and follow Altman to Microsoft, a major investor in AI. No hard feelings, says Microsoft. They're happy to work with Altman, back at his old job, with a new board of directors in a classic power struggle Altman seems to have won. The doomsayers have been vanquished. Those who want to accelerate the rate of artificial intelligence development won this battle. Experts say buckle up. This fast-growing technology where machines can think like humans has the potential to change how the world works. From treating cancer, writing a high school essay, to potential dangers, disinformation, even fake AI-generated images in political ads like this one. This morning, an emboldened China invades Taiwan. All of it happening faster than the rules can be written. Does this underline how we need regulation, both in the U.S. and in the EU, which is putting the finishing touches on their AI act right now. Altman's return capping a week of chaos in the futuristic world of artificial intelligence. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Washington. And still ahead. They use that platform to, to kind of, you know, degrade me. The King's representative opens up about online hate. The first Indigenous Governor General in Canada's history is speaking out about online hate and abuse at a time when there is a sharp increase in both. It's a topic Mary Simon has some personal experience with, and she now wants to use her position to help others targeted on social media. CTV's Donna Sound sat down with the Governor General. When Mary Simon became the first Indigenous Governor General, she soon discovered a lot of people out there don't like change. When I was uh, installed as Governor General, um, I became a target. <laughs> so there was a lot of um, negative uh, f um, comments that were made towards me as an individual, as a woman, as an Indigenous person. She closed the comments section of her social media accounts because the abuse is that bad. They use that platform to, to kind of you know, degrade me. It's her goal to use her platform to change this online hate. If we internalize it and just walk away from social media, it's not going to change. One in five women experience online harassment in Canada. That number is even higher for Indigenous women, with 30% experiencing unwanted behaviour online. Raised in Nunavik, Quebec, she's bilingual, but not in the traditional way for a governor general. She speaks fluent Inuktitut. So at 76 years of age, she's learning how to speak French. We went to federal day school. We weren't allowed to speak. We weren't allowed to speak our indigenous language, which is Inuktitut in my case. We could only speak English. There was no French offered anywhere. Her advice to women? I would tell somebody I trust about what's going on, not to keep it to themselves. Because if they, if you, when you internalize something, it becomes harder to, to express it verbally. 
racialized women have long been targets to all forms of abuse. But Simon hopes that she and other women in high-profile positions can make a difference so all women can live a life without hate. Donna Sound, CTV News, Toronto. Downtown Montreal was party central for CFL football fans celebrating the Alouette's surprising Grey Cup championship. Nobody in the CFL believed in us. All y'all believed in us. All y'all did. Many preseason predictions had them finishing at the bottom of the league standings, but the Owls upset the Winnipeg Blue Bombers on Sunday for their first Grey Cup win since 2010 and the eighth in franchise history. Great crowd. After the break. It is the place where we push the boundaries of what is possible. Canada's newest astronauts get their orders. Canadian content in space got a major boost today. CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin on the new assignments. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for our two astronauts that are going to mark Canada's history in space. More Canadian footprints along Canada's journey of space exploration. Former Canadian Armed Forces pilot Joshua Kutrick landed an assignment to the International Space Station. He will embark on a six-month mission in early 2025. Kutrick will be the fourth astronaut to fly the Maple Leaf on board the station for a long-term mission, carrying out a series of scientific experiments. It is the place where we push the boundaries of what is possible. That's what we've always done, and as we keep pushing that boundary out, we keep doing that. We keep pushing the limits of what we, we know. The Alberta-born, space-bound mission specialist will also mark a first. He will be aboard NASA's commercial spaceship Boeing's CST-100 Starliner on its maiden crewed voyage. The other astronaut of the class of 2017, Jenny Seide Gibbons, also from Alberta, will train as backup on one of the historic voyages that will one day return humans to the moon, stepping in if necessary to the moon. On the Orion spacecraft ride assigned to Canada's Jeremy Hansen, set to circle the moon as early as November 2024. Canada is proud of space and to be able to be a part of that journey through Jeremy's assignment and backing him up, making sure that we have secured our place on that mission means a lot. Kutrick's journey to the ISS will mean leaving the planet and all those at home for months. Because yeah, that's, that's a very unique thing to, to say goodbye and then to get on a rocket and, and leave the planet. That's, that's the ultimate goodbye, so it'll be hard. But out of this world, travel is the dream of a lifetime for these astronauts, and their missions secure place in space for Canada. Jean-Bierre Beauchemin, CTV News, Longueuil, Quebec. And that's a snapshot of this Wednesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching, and good night.